Okay, this is John Reed at Salesforce Connection 2018. We are choking on fumes here at the final day. <laughs> I'm with a uh, guest that you won't, you won't even believe that I got this guy. I got Esteban Kolsky. What's going on? Hey, glad to be here. I'm here to ask you questions that no one's ever asked you before that the entire enterprise world has been wondering about for years. I was born in Argentina. Yeah. I am the same in my personal life as I am in my professional life. <laughs> those those weren't exactly what I had in mind. I was going to ask you, like, why are you such a grouchy prick, Esteban? I'm not grouchy. I'm just... <laughs> look, when I, when I joined Gartner, I went to boot camp, and I was told during Gartner boot camp that the highest level that a Gartner analyst could achieve is being labeled a curmudgeon by their peers. Right. There was only one person in entire Gartner history, Ben, ben I don't know, Ken McGee, that had actually managed to get that. That. And he was, you think I'm grouchy, you should have met him. <laughs> he was my role model. Well, I would argue that, that the grouchiness in this context is is a sign of an idealist who gets yeah. frustrated by hearing the same disappointing stuff. I, I see my job very simple. My job is to hold the vendor's feet to the fire. Right. And when I hear the same thing year after year, no progress, and they yeah. come back, you know, 10 years from now, and they say, hey, this is a great new idea. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Right. It's keeping it PG. <laughs> you know? Are you kidding me? This is something we discussed, you know, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 3 years ago, 2 years ago, and last year, and you guys haven't done anything on it. So that's what is considered to be grouchy. Then I'll be grouchy. Right. So you're really an idea that's frustrated about how far we are from what's possible. I'm a purist. I yeah. just want nothing but the best. Yeah. And as far as curmudgeons go, there's a few in your category, I would say, but it's not easy to get there. No. My, I might throw Brian Summers hat in the ring. Yep. Dennis Hallett. <laughs> yep. That's about it. But, but it's, it's the same concept, right? I mean, this, these are people that really, truly want something better. They're not just being grudgy for the sake of being grudgy. Oh, yeah. They just want, we want, I mean, I'm going to put myself in that exactly. category, you know, we want something better. I, I, I was told that you can never give yourself the title of curmudgeon that needs to be given to you by somebody. Oh, absolutely. So. Yeah, you can't be a self-appointed curmudgeon. No. But, but, I mean, I don't care what the title is. I mean, I've been called many things, some of them even, you know, that I can mention, right? But, but the idea is like, you know, I want something better. I, I see what's possible, and I see how, you know, vendors for the most part decided not to utilize the possible because it's hard and go with the simple that sells easy and I just don't find that acceptable. Right. And you're you're really one I think of kind of a few of us standing as what I would call a true independent analyst in that yeah. you 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 run your own show but you also do research which is there are a handful of independents who blog and such but like you actually try to do discipline research on your own. How do you do that? <laughs> very, very hard. <laughs> it's not actually. This is the thing, uh, and I had to keep referring to Gardner. But like you know, I, I was like most of the people. I was lost in my life before I came to Gardner. Gardner gave me guidance and, and freedom to be myself. Right? They didn't and, sponsor this podcast, <laughs> by the way. Just so you guys know, it was the best job that I had in the most horribly run company in the universe. I mean, the company is yeah. running away that you just want to leave every day. But but the job was great, and I got trained in a way that like you know. I see the value of, of primary research, even right. at a point where most uh, research houses have gone away from that, right? Constellation is starting to do some now, but most people are going away. And, and primary research is what actually gives you insights that you don't get anywhere else. Right. So I, I talk to, like you do, I mean, thousands of people every year about all these different topics. And in addition to that, I get, like, you know, some very, in my opinion, well thought out questions about specifics that they don't turn into research reports. So what research areas are you obsessed with that you're trying to learn more about? Data. Data. Data, da data is like, it's, it's driving me crazy the last couple of years. I mean, I, I tried to make it, you know, uh, formalize, and you and I had a conversation about this earlier. I even blogged about it when I said, right. like, you know, I, I, I beat him more than, than, than I can chew on that, right? Yeah, you issued a very ambitious research agenda. I did. And when I read it, I was like, how the hell are you going to do that? And, and, I, and, and I started out down you didn't do it, so I, I feel a little better. Yeah, no, I started down on that path, yeah. and, and I found very, very quickly that uh, with being a single person, it doesn't really give yeah. to, to doing that. So it was an attempt. Every couple of years, I tried to redo my, my, my life into a new model, and, and you know, I, I found that um, <clears throat> what I call sponsored research projects. I have things that I want to do. I find people that are interested in the same concept. They give me money. I do it, and I keep total control and editorial responsibility and everything. And it works really well. It does, you know, and, and it doesn't give doesn't lead to very ambitious research agendas that they hand you to shelf. But going back to the question, data 
is data is uh, the data uses. What are called data uses? What are people using data for? How are they using it? You know, we're talking about AI. It's about data. You talk about digital. It's about data. Everything that we're talking about is about having clean data. Well, right. And I uh, I just talked with a customer at a different show about their use of predictive, and they were trying to anticipate certain patterns of their customer base. And they said we got to 71 percent. And the reason they blamed it was they didn't have enough data sets and they didn't have enough quality data sets. Those were the problems that were preventing them from getting... I would, I would pick the second one over the first one. Yeah. The data set is not the problem, it's the quality of the data set. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, the, the, the computer does what it's told, and the computer can only deduce what it's yeah. given, right? It's, it's really, it's, computers are not smart. We, no matter what we try, they'll never be smart. They, they do what we tell right. them to do. We give them bad data, they'll give, they give us bad results. So you and I, before we started taping, we decided that we're not going to venture into the SAP versus Salesforce CRM wars as much as people might want us to do. In fact, I don't even view it as a war. I wouldn't, oh, even, no. I wouldn't even call it a skirmish at this point. Yeah. But, <laughs> but <laughs> this is this is like a, this is like the guy who got arrested and go to the uh, prison. Right. He looks for the biggest guy in the yard and tries to slap him. Yeah. <laughs> I think I see there go like mosquitoes. Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, you can always rewatch um, what's the HBO prison series. Oh, uh, Oz. Oz. You yeah. can watch Oz if you want to get exactly. a feeling for that. <laughs> but, but what I do want to talk about a little bit, since we are at Salesforce Connect, and they, and they did you know, get us here, um, about customer experience and the role yeah. of data there. Because I think that I struggle a little bit with this concept in the sense that I don't... I don't think we're anywhere near the kind of customer experiences that we that, that we really crave. We're not. And, and, and data is clearly a big reason, right? Like the disconnection in data, the inability to, uh, you know, when you call a company you've done business with for years right. and they treat you like a friggin' stranger. Right. Like, so where, where do you stand on this whole customer experience and data? So, like, where so are we and where can we go? Here's, here's why you're right, that we're nowhere near where we should be, right? The main reason for that is, like, you know, companies are used to having control. Uh, that's the bottom line. Companies want to say, oh, you want to change your balance, you got to do this six, you want to change your address, this is six steps you need to do, right? And, and uh, you want to you wanna do this, this is the process that we follow. And that's how they, they, they actually keep control and they make it easier for them to operate. Surprisingly enough, customers don't like that. Paul, Paul Greenberg, who you know, he's here, you know, he's, he's the, called the godfather of CRM. He wrote in uh, the, the CRM at the Speed of Light, the fourth edition that came out in 2009, uh, he wrote that uh, the, the biggest change in the last you know, 20 years has been the change in control of the conversation. Not the change in the control, control of the conversation. So customers became more aware of what they wanted and they're not afraid to say what they want, right? But when you want to keep control of the, of the experience or the interaction, or whatever you want to call it, right? You end up finding a customer that is not willing to do that. So then that that dichotomy, that that clash is what's actually putting us where we are today. Where like companies still want to keep to this illusion of control and delivering experience to customers. Our customers are saying like, screw you, I want to do my own experience. I want to choose when I talk to you, how I talk to you, what I give you, what I get, and I want to choose how I do things. And that is what we're actually seeing playing out right now. It's like the, the next generation of customer experience. In 2001, when, you know, I wrote a, a report on customer experience that was like 48 pages long, and it was mostly academic because we had no idea what we were talking about. Right. We have now 15, 20 years of like you know actual experience doing these things, and what we realize is that customers will do whatever they want. We don't get to determine the journeys. We don't get to determine the experiences. The best that a company can do is create a platform so the customer can choose what they want the experience to be at that specific moment, which will be different next time, and then just do it. Instead of saying, like, oh, we're going to build the best experience and deliver awesome experiences, you can't. You don't know what the customer wants at the time that they're actually connected with you. That's interesting. So you're, you're kind of implying that the biggest barrier here is, I don't want to say ego, but it's kind of a control problem where you have Let's to... Let's call it ego. Okay. Ego? <laughs> Let's call it you ego. You have to pull yourself out of the mix and focus more on... I, I still the customer dictates their own journey. Here's, here's the best way to determine why we have a problem. The first question, no, the second question that I always get when people want to talk about customer experience is like, who's in charge of the customer experience? 
right? Meaning, is marketing going to run? And is service going to run? And is sales going to run? And who's going to run customer experience? And the idea that somebody has to create and run customer experience, I mean, I, I wrote a series in my blog post back in 2005 about it because that was how we thought about it 13 and 15 years ago. But today, that's no longer the case. The customer's in charge of the customer experience and the, the, you know, the IT department's in charge of creating the platform. And, and you know, the, 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 we can't get anywhere in experience with that data because, I mean, the data is what actually personalizes and creates, you know, the right experiences, right? That's the key. Right. And in the post uh, keynote chat with uh, Chief Product Officer Brett Taylor, Mm -hmm. who's the uh, keynote uh, MC of yesterday's keynote on B2B commerce, you you kind of pressed this issue a little bit with him because you brought up the issue of why don't you talk more about end-to-end right. solutions, which I think fits right in with our discussion, right? It does. That's, um, that's exactly right. As yeah. opposed to like thinking about in terms of here's your service cloud, here's your commerce cloud, right. here's your... It, 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 all start, it all starts from the point that like, you know, when you change things about it and you say, okay, Mr. Customer, you're in control. Tell me what you want and how you want it, right? And I'll just make sure that you have what you need to deliver. Then you're not going to say, oh, you know what I need? I need marketing information. And then I need a salesperson to call me tomorrow. And then three days from now, I need a service person to call me. I mean, you're there and you're like, well, I bought this product last week that's not working. But, you know, it's still, I like the way it works when it works. So I want to get more of that. And, and, you know, while I'm there, like, you know, also heard that you have a product coming next year and I want to get some information. Traditionally, those are like three or four or six or ten different interactions. This is all in one. We, we move from like you know one in one one to one interactions to continuous where like every single time that you get in, t- in touch with the company you can do whatever you want so then you know you need to reply to that and that's not service by saying oh we're going to sell you service software we're going to sell you marketing software we're going to sell you sales software it's service by saying we're going to get you a platform that actually creates this ability to interact with customers and let them build their own experiences any way they want by the way readers if you want to dig further Check out uh, Esteban's uh, Think Jar blog, blog on EstebanKolsky.com, where he just wrote a post recently on experience engagement, same difference, which gets into some of these issues. Now I want to talk about another post of yours, the Three Eyes of AI. Yeah. Um, because a lot of vendors, I think, with the predicament we're talking about, they're, they think they're going to solve this with AI and sort of hyper-personalization. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you think that is part of the solution and just in general what do you well, what is your gist of AI right now so so Without making myself look old, I, I was doing AI in, in 1980s, in the mid, mid-1980s when uh, we called it then the fifth generation. The, the Japanese government decided that this was going to be the future of the world, and they invested, you know, at the time, hundreds of millions of dollars, which is a lot more than they were, most people are investing today in understanding AI going forward the next generation. This is something we'd be doing for, like, you know, more than in 1980s. From the 1960s, when we first got computers, we said, how can we make them you know, resemble our human intelligence, right? So we're not doing anything new. What we have different is the ability to process. The ability to process is like, you know, a hundredfold what it was back then. I mean, back then, the, 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 in the 1980s, the fastest computer was slower than my iPhone today. We can crunch massive data sets, which plays to the strengths of certain kinds of machine intelligence, such as mm-hmm. facial recognition, right, yep. where you need massive data yeah. sets. We can actually take a picture and break it down into pixels, which you, we couldn't do really well back then. I remember when I was right. running to program basic, I used to do pixel pictures, and they were like, you know... The, horrible. But but all these things, I mean, the, the, the data is the key, like I was saying before, but the processing power is what actually makes a difference in AI. I mean, is AI going to change everything? I hope so. I... I don't like people. I like computers. They do what they're told. People do what they think they should do. There's a big difference here. If you're a business, you want someone who's going to do what it's told to do. And, and you know, automation is is, is got to be the next wave in in, in, in businesses. I, I talked to a customer here who uh, is working on a Einstein powered. Uh, and of course, we're using the term AI loosely, right? Yeah. Because uh, so we're really talking more about automation aspects. But we're talking about uh, the basic elements of analytics, like predictive yeah. uh, and, and uh, some, you know, image recognition, language recognition. But, but yeah. anyway, they have they have service issues, which is the volume, yeah. and they they want to you know enable their call center to focus obviously on sort of either high value customers or really tricky problems. So they're mm-hmm. going to have a bot that's, that they're going to put out there that's going to yeah. walk people through the basic stuff. And um, I thought it was interesting. I mean. I I could see, I could see bots being helpful for certain things. I could also yeah. see myself as a kind of person who get very frustrated and angry with the bot. <laughs> um, Not 
if they do the right thing. This, this is yeah. the key, right? For, for a bot to be effective, you need to know what's the outcome of that bot, and right. you need to actually inform the customer of that, right? So if you right. if you fly, pick your favorite airline, airline, you know, train or whatever, and they lose your luggage and you want to get your luggage back, and they say, call this number, and it's powered by a bot, and they say, go to this website, and it's powered by a bot, they should tell you, all I can do is deal with your lost luggage. Right. Your frustrations and all this stuff, I'll listen to them, but they're not going to go anywhere from here. Right? Yeah, and that's we had an interesting conversation with this customer around whether they should disclose that it's a bot or not. I think they should. Yeah, I always see. You know, and I feel that's important. But yeah. I, I think about it in terms of like my Lux units around the house. Like the reason that works for me is because I, I figured out exactly what the limitations are, mm-hmm. and so the interactions are satisfactory because I know. So I could see in a service capacity that could work, as, like you're saying, as long as if I know it's a bot and it's solving a specific problem. And by the way, I can escalate it to the human properly. So it seems to me that it's more about design, right? It is, it is entirely about, it's about two things. It's about realizing, like you said, realizing the limits, right? People think that bots are like Star Trek computers. It's like, you know, you know the Star Trek, or, you know, if you were a Star Wars person, same thing. Computer, show me the, the Alpha, Alpha Omega Galaxy. Uh, and, um, you know, just take me there, right? Like, it knows how it's, what it's to do. But bots are more like, you know, single function, very, very focused in understanding the language around one problem and one resolution. At best, it can do two, maybe three, but usually it's one-to-one. So what you end up, as an organization, you end up with, like, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of bots that handle all these different problems automatically. And then how do you manage that? It's the next, the next uh, generation problem, right? But they, we've been doing bots, I mean, chatbots for business. Uh, they've been around since like the, the late 90s, right? Uh, the first chatbot was Eliza, who was in the 1978, I think it was, or like it was basically a psychotherapist. That you, you, it, it was exactly what you think a psychotherapist should do, right? You say, I don't feel well today, and I said, why, why, why do you feel that way? <laughs> well, you know, I feel like a little under the weather. What, what, what do you think is under the weather? Mean? <laughs> It basically repeated your, your statements with the question at the end, and yeah. it was very successful. But real business bots were, were come from like you know late nineties, early early two thousands, right. and we're doing the same thing today that we were doing back then, except that again, processing power, the ability to integrate more data, the ability to integrate more processes, gives them greater ability to resolve the problems faster. Right now, in your AI post, you said uh, AI will never match human intelligence because it lacks the three eyes. Yes. Uh, so now we're kind of talking about sort of more general AI intelligence of yeah. use, intuition, imagination, and innovation. Right. So you don't think those things can ultimately be programmed? No. No, they can because, I actually say in the post, they can be programmed to an extent, but they're never going to be exactly the same, right? I mean, to me, AI is a real AI. Well, we're talking about predictive and, and uh, you know, right. prescriptive and all this. Those are just elements of advanced analytics. But true AI, like, you get you get from, like, you know, advanced analytics to machine learning to true AI when the machine actually can think by itself. If you really think about the way we learn and how we do things, right, a lot of the decisions we made are based on incomplete data sets. And computers are horrible incomplete data sets. So you can actually relax the, the rules a little bit. You can tell them, you know what, don't really focus on this part. But still, the jumps that, the, you know, some of the examples that I put in my blog, Alexander Fleming discovering penicillin. I mean, he left a sandwich overnight in his lab. Who, who the hell is going to think that that's going to lead to, like, solving half the world's problems, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, th- this is the thing. It's like, you know, that's, that's basically intuition. It's like, you know, you know, I... I I know I should throw this away, but there's something that tells me not to. You can program that level of like uncertainty to yeah. computers. Computers are ones and zeros, and you know, uh, until quantum computing comes along and it shows something different, which we are like you know decades, if not hundreds of years away, then we, we, we're not going to worry about anything more than what we have. So, are you uh, telling marketers that they shouldn't use the term AI anymore? I would tell them that, like I've been saying for the last ten years, but nobody listens to me. So here we are. <laughs> Yeah. Dude, yeah, we, uh, besides, we run out. We run out of smart people to put to name products after. We had Watson, and we had uh, Einstein, and we have uh, uh, I forgot the other ones. But you know, do, do we have a Newton? There's a Newton somewhere there, right? Yeah. So we, we got all the scientists and everybody. Other way. The only one left is Marie Curie, and uh, we, you know, I'm sure we're gonna see it in a few in a few years. Yeah, I think the only thing that bothers me about this whole discussion so far is just this 
I struggle a little bit with the empowered customer just because I think like it really varies by situation. Like for example, I'm a heavy I'm heavy reliant upon Google services. I feel completely powerless in connection to Google. Yep. And I think one of the dangers... You and I, we both are. I, I, am the same. I, I choose the ones that I engage with, but I'm completely powerless. Like, and, and Google clearly doesn't feel any accountability towards me. Nope. And yet I hear all this hype around customer experience control. I don't feel like control of Google at all. But you are, because, I mean, you, you still have a choice, right? Sure. It, it, I mean, at the end sure, of the day... but I'm fairly locked in in a certain sense. I, it, it's not that I could never walk away. It's just that... Never, never forget how much you're paying Google. Right. I mean, yeah. that, that's part of the equation, right? I mean, sure. if you were to be paying Google, they would take your opinions into consideration a lot more. A little more, right, right yeah. Because they know you can go away. But, but you, I, pay, you still... I pay the airlines a fair amount of money. They don't give a shit about me. Yeah, but that's a model that is so broken that that is impossible right. to fix. But see, that's what I'm talking about. I right. think this varies a lot by industry. I actually had conversations with uh, one of the major American airlines. Uh, yeah, uh, one of the major airlines in America. <laughs> Let's just be clear. We're not talking about American Airlines. We're talking about... We may or may an not be, but I'm not trying to make it... Exa- <laughs> exactly. One of the major Amer- yeah, airlines in America. And um, I actually talked to uh, direct level people at the call center, and they said, like, you know, we're so tired of having to deal with people that complain about all this crap, and we take it to management, and management doesn't listen to us. So uh, how do we solve that? I had this conversation that lasted almost a year with these people, you know, in one of my projects, trying to guide him and get into that. Uh, you know what was the end result of this? Screw it. you got to ignore management. you got to do what you think that you should do. And, and they did for a while, and then management overpowered them and threw away all the stuff, and they went back to the thing. The thing there's, a, there's an endemic problem in airlines and, and many other areas You know that, that is slowly going to be resolved. I mean, hotels used to be the same as airlines, but they're doing much, much better now. Right. They realize that the, the survival you know, stems from actually doing something better. Right? As soon as we get something that disrupts our Airlines like you know Airbnb did for hotels. Yeah, they'll be go more hyper, eager. Go, go, yeah, hyper, exactly, go, exactly. Go. Yeah. It's all it's a function of anti competition and lack thereof. And why why would I spend money and time and reduce my profits to do something that? But I think there is an interesting dynamic. I mean, Google's probably not the best example to your point because I'm not paying Google a whole lot of money though I do buy Android phones and yeah. stuff like that. But I think uh, the clash against customer choice is the convenience of the platform. Right. So. You know, you standardize on Apple Home and and Apple devices, and so, you know, now all your kids are using them, so you're really going to suddenly move away from Apple and go home, it's going to be a friggin' nightmare, man. You're going to face like a family protest. If I could get my kids to get off Apple, I would be so happy, right? You see what I mean? I know. There's an interesting form of lock-in that comes from a well-executed platform. But you have to understand that Apple... I'm I'm turning this on. You see what I'm doing? Because you're a platform advocate, so... I am. And and I, I I believe that if you look at two platforms that are basically doing the same, the two of the, the many that there are, right? You take Facebook and take Apple, right? Their presence in our lives is undeniable. There, there it is. You can. I mean, I am not on Facebook, but uh, my kids use, you know, I use WhatsApp, right? right. My kids use uh, Instagram and they use right. WhatsApp. And, and, you know, we, we somewhat we are in the Facebook world, even though right. we're not in the Facebook world. So, I mean, that, that exists. Uh, I, I, I use Apple devices. I mean, I have a MacBook. I have a, an iPhone. I resist it as long as I could. But, shit, I mean, my laptops would die every six months. This thing I had for like, you know, four years. And, and I took it to Apple once because it slowed down and said, oh, we're going to give you a brand new one because this one is an, uh, one that we did that we're not happy with. Right? So guess what? I mean, they do listen to you a lot more. They may not seem to be that way. They don't have, you know, smart bots crawling the world and making people happy. But once you get engaged with Apple, you get what you need in a fairly simple way. You don't get that from Facebook. You have a problem with Facebook. Good luck. You know? And, and the Which difference is a problem of data business models that are supposedly free. Yeah. What you're really paying for is a complete lack of power to address your situation. And you're paying for somebody to take your information and do whatever they want with it. All right. Before we wrap, let's talk about your enterprise software priorities for the next decade, which is yeah. the recent post. Uh, you came up with uh, five. Five. So um, what, which one jumps out offhand? 
we'll go Sweets are dead. The last one, Sweets are dead. Yeah. End of the story. I mean, yeah. they, they're all, they all play into each other if you think about it, right? But, uh, That's it, interesting because I see a lot of cloud sweets lately. You do, but you know what? That's because it's the last the last attempt to get some money before it goes away. <laughs> this is the last gas. Right? Yeah. And, 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 you know, without going back into the SAP versus Salesforce thing, this yeah. is the thing that upset me the most about SAP. It's like SAP has so much talent and so much technology they could use, and they go back to, like, marketing to, to cast a, a path for the company forward, which reflects what happened 20 years ago, and they couldn't make it work. But, but the thing is, like, platforms are the solution for the future. And, and, you know, everything leads to, like, you know, for enterprise software, it's like the CIO is in charge of, like, consolidating clouds, aggregating data, and delivering a platform for the company so they can do it. So the, the employees can do whatever they want, any way they want, easily. That's, so that's would you be a proponent, then, of a future where if I'm trying to construct uh, a particular uh, set of services, uh, around, let, let's say, uh, in order to cache scenario that I might plug and plug and play from. Another Absolutely, program. you should. Uh, so, so essentially, it's almost a microservice. I mean, it's a microservices architecture. Yeah. Space. We, we call that. You can, you can go back. Yeah. I, I was, I was, uh, I was talking about a uh, uh, Corva and Com Decom and SOAs, you know, the service center architectures and all that stuff. And I, I, I had the same message. I mean, in 1995, I wrote a position paper on Corva that exactly called for that model before we even had the. Internet, you know, yeah, and 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 still looking at the same thing today. It seems like technologies are advancing, but what is not is our our ability to actually grasp what the technology can bring and do it. And, and I tend to agree, but uh, the, the the most effective rebuttal I hear to that vision is sort of what happens to the one throat to choke thing that a lot of customers like, right? If they're if they're assembling microservices from different vendors and something breaks, like what happens then? It's called the CIO. <laughs> oh, you get smart. You get a smart CIO, which I, I know a lot of them right now. You get a smart CIO, and they're not afraid of that. They don't care about one vendor that went throat to choke. They, they want to become okay. the responsible one because they okay. know that the platform they're building is going to deliver what they need to deliver. And it's going to be flexible enough. But to do that, you need to have the cooperation of the vendors to charge your licenses that are like you know bearable and useful in that type of model. Because then, if not, you end up with a lock-in from any vendor. Pick anyone. They'll have a lock-in in, in, in what you do it, that, it, that is most done by licenses. Yeah. You're not going to pay 250 bucks per person to access you know, a, a marketing data model that is restricted to very few operations and then pay 250 bucks to do, per person to do like one more function that they don't do. You're going to go with the subpar function and like suffer through it. That's what a suite basically does. So I think I would modify your prediction slightly and say if, you're, if you have a strategic IT investment, software suites are dead because I think, yeah. for example, smaller companies, SMBs, I think are going to be very, fairly suite dependent in a lot of cases. Companies without IT departments are going to be fairly sweet dependent, yeah. I think. But companies, but companies that use IT for a variety of strategic initiatives, including like building their own smart devices and smart applications, mm -hmm. I think those are the majority those are of the leading, Those are the leading edge. And that's but, but don't forget, I think what you're don't forget about. SMBs, right? Which, which yeah. are like 60, 70 percent of the world, not just yeah. the United States, but the world. SMBs they require a use of technology that is nowhere near what, like you know, the large ones oh, provide. Exactly. Right. And it's not about yeah. having a reduced set of, uh, of elements from the same platform. It's about doing a flexible platform that allows you to do whatever you need. So this is a revolution that is going to be like, you know, more grassroots than any other one. It's going to be led. So far, cloud adoption is 96, 97 percent in SMBs and, and less than 30 percent in large enterprises. And we're going to continue to see this. This is going to be a revolution that is going to be led from, from below by SMBs actually changing the way they work and companies saying, customers saying to companies, why can't you be more like them? Right. So, and just whipping through the rest of these, some of these we've kind of covered, but your first one is sustainability is job one. That's really all about the, the traction that cloud computing has got right. to build sustainable architectures, platforms and leverage of the new normal. We kind of covered the platforms part in the ubiquity of platforms that are going to be necessary for the kinds of services mm -hmm. you're describing. Budgets are different. You kind of talked about how budgets have come come back, but but the multi-million dollar, multi-year type of project has sort of gone away. Right. So, we're talking so we're doing piecemeal approach. Iterative, yeah. you know, prove it, small I, wins, build momentum. I haven't right. talked to a single, you know, CEO, CMO, uh, I, you know, CIO who are the purchasing agency stays, yeah. who said, I'm just going to buy the product. They all buy pilots and they slowly grow them, you know. And, and, and companies are getting around that by selling enterprise licenses for the same cost of a pilot before, so they can say that they're actually embedded in the organization. And, and then they try to, to ensure that lock-in. 
And I want to talk just briefly before we wrap about your final one in the list, the rise of the citizen programmer. I found this interesting because obviously this has gone through a lot of iterations in terms of what people talk about. Like yeah. it was now it's about low code. Low and code, no code. code. Yeah. And and this has also been discussed for a long time. Do you yeah. think we're finally turning a corner on this? And if so, why? If an organization adopts a platform to focus world to see the way, which is the, the world, which is what we discuss, right? I mean, you get the right. best services, you deliver. Then, yeah, any any person can program any any solution they want. If you don't, if you, if your platform becomes, you know, an aggregation of clouds that that is basically still with locking into like data models and still locked in into like you know functionality that is subpar, no, you can't. So, so, I mean, do I see that we turn the corner? I, I do. I, I do believe, and I do see more and more organizations that are giving their users mobile devices and, and like development environments that are like click and you know what was it they say today tapping, not typing, right? I mean, right. They're, they're basically click and tap to, to build your own application for what you need. Any person who does a job needs literally five to ten data points and three functions to do their ninety percent of the job that they do. Right. Why would you give them an application that has like you know huge screens with lots of stuff that never gets used? Right. And I think developers are more and more relying upon building blocks as well. When you think about like yeah. they all have predictive libraries, they're not building a lot of this stuff from scratch. The, the more Twilio's that show up in this world, you know, the, the more Trulies that show up in this world, the more libraries that are open source and, and, and available. Yeah, the, the more they can do whatever they want. And, and you know, the, the, the largest growth in budget in IT departments has not been infrastructure but developers because they're all going back to like building their own the old components building their own infrastructure that they need to do well I'm looking forward to a bunch more low code no code PR emails in my inbox <laughs> conversations. Be, oh, no 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 PR, PR is out of, that's out of the bounds of this discussion uh, that should be great for me in my last uh, enterprise hits and misses I described you as an enterprise gadfly and then also in a strike through I described you as a wild, wildebeest and I linked to the article because it was funny because yes. it refers to wildebeest as an implausibility which yes. I think is a good, a good which is by the way my, my LinkedIn bio I like now. this the implausible Stefan <laughs> Kolsky thank you um, and it is it is my it became my LinkedIn bio my LinkedIn bio it says nice. I've been de- I'm an, I've been officially demon implausibility <laughs> yet I'm here <laughs> and and the other phrase I liked in this article of wildebeest it's they refer to them as the itinerant enigmas which I think is also <laughs> potentially a, a good one for you. I thought it was a fantastic article yeah, man. yeah. I, 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 so, I mean I've been called many things but that's probably the one that fits the best anyway folks that's a half an hour with the implausible S. von Kolsky thanks thank you half an hour wow thank you so much later Bye.